because he's got an important job? <laughs> that sounds pretty important. <laughs> So I've called this meeting of the City Council of Aurora Grande to order. And if we could have a roll call, please. Councilmember Seacrest? Here. Councilmember George is absent. Councilmember Barnage? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Guthrie? Here. And Mayor Ray Rustin is absent. All right. And if you could join me in a moment of reflection. Thank you. And yeah, now if you'll rise if you if you can and join me in the flag salute. <clears throat> Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, is anyone interested in changing the agenda? No, thank any, you. Any staff changes to the agenda? No, thank you. All right. And I'll move that we adopt all ordinance, ordinances read in title only. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. So, we'll move on to the special presentations. And tonight we do have an honorary. Uh, proclamation recognizing February 2024 is Black History Month. So if uh, Cheryl Vines and Roxanne Perez could join me here at the at the podium, I will start reading. The honorary proclamation recognizing February 24 is Black History Month, whereas the city of Arroyo Grande is welcome. Whereas the city of Roy Grande is welcoming, inclusive, and dedicated to improving the quality of life for those who live, work, and visit here, and whereas Black History Month grew out of the establishment in 1926 of the Negro History Week by Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And whereas the observance of Black History Month calls our attention to the continued need to battle racism and build a society that lives up to its democratic ideals, and whereas the ASALH was established in 2024, the 2024 national theme of observance of this year's Black History Month as the African Americans and the arts, spanning the many impacts Black Americans have had in the visual arts, music, cultural movements, and more. And whereas the city of Arroyo Grande continues to work toward becoming an inclusive community in which all individuals, past, present, and future, are respected and recognized for their contributions and potential contributions to our community, the state, the country, and the world. And whereas the city of Arroyo Grande is proud to honor the history and contributions of African Americans in our community throughout our state and nation, now, therefore, be resolved that I, for Karen Ray Russin, Mayor of the City of Arroyo Grande, do hereby proclaim February 2024 as Black History Month and encourage all, celebra all citizens to celebrate our diverse heritage, culture, and continue our efforts to create a world that is more just, peaceful, and, prosper and prosperous for all. Thank you for being here, and if you'd like to say some words, we would appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Thank you. So I'm Carol Vines, and I am the one of the co-founders and um, secretary and win chair for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And so a lot of people know it as the NAACP. So we're happy to be here. And um, um, uh, the mayor pro tem did say, so give some of the history of what I was going to say, and, and that's fine. But I just wanted to add on in 1986 that Congress passed a joint resolution declaring February National Black History Month, and presidents have issued annual proclamations for National Black History Month every year since 1996. And um, something that you might not know is that um, 
originally it was just celebrated for one week in February. And the reason for that is um, President Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass birthdays happen to be in the same on the same day or in the same month. I, I think it's the same day as well. But um, so they wanted to celebrate um, the history, you know, of black people in America. And so they uh, named uh, for just for one week. And now in 1986, it became, you know, for a whole month. Um, so I don't know if you know anything about um, the NAACP, but our branch has um, been around since um, May of 2017. And we're a county-wide organization, uh, so we, uh, from Napomo all the way, you know, to North County, and we really focus on race and justice, uh, fighting racial injustices by building black political, social, and economic power. We are an inclusive organization, so any and everyone can join. Uh, we concentrate on education, environment and climate justice, inclusive economy, uh, mobility and thriving black economy, health and well-being. And um, we would like to thank you for this proclamation. And we're looking forward to seeing some of you at some of our events throughout February. Hello, my name is Roxanne Perez, and I'm Cheryl uh, Vine's sister. Um, I, uh, we've been in the area for a lot, many years, and uh, we've enjo I've enjoyed my time in this area. I, I have had the opportunity to go to, to visit other areas, to move to other areas, but I have not done it. I like it right here. <laughs> um, so um, I'm, we're, I, I'm just happy that the uh, you know, I was able to grow up in, in an area that had that where there was, you know, peace and and not a lot of, uh, 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 you know, things that were negative. OK. And then so so I've been a resident of this area. Uh, oh, it's probably been close to maybe 40 years, no, it's more than 40 years. <laughs> it's a lot more years than that. Some. It's 60 some. <laughs> She doesn't want to give her See, age. I didn't want to give my, my age. Okay. So I enjoy living in the area. I enjoy, um, you know, it's just so much to enjoy the beauty the of, the of nature, all kinds of things. And so it's hard for me to actually leave. And I don't have any um, uh, uh, plans to leave. So I'd just like to thank you all for all you've done and um, hope that everything uh, works out well and that we uh, continue to have a good relationship and uh, things will uh, grow and pe the, our, our um, economy will, will improve and, and I'm just very happy to be here and hope that in some way that maybe I could help uh, in this with this situation also <clears throat> okay well thank you for the uh proclamation and do we get a copy or do we already get one we're, we're gonna get it signed and then we'll mail it to you oh okay yeah, great can, the, the mayor's not here to sign it oh okay and you have our mailing address just want to make sure <laughs> okay i'm sure you do because we've received them before so thank you and um we do have some events planned for February, and of course, our Juneteenth celebration will be on June 15th, so mark your calendars, and we'll be reaching out to you for that. Thank you. Thank you. With, with that, we'll move on to the city manager's communicative report. Well, thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the city council, Matt Downing, your city manager. Uh, that's still interesting to say. Uh, here being the uh, the second meeting of my of my tenure. So, um, a couple of updates for you this evening. Uh, over on the public works front, I did want to let you know that the traffic traffic loops and sensors at the Mason and Branch Street intersection have been repaired and are now operational. I know we had talked about that previously, so that should help traffic flow in that area. 
Uh, over in community development, the Planning Commission did recently make some recommendations to the City Council regarding uh, both the formula business ordinance and the accessory dwelling unit ordinance. So those will be coming to the Council in the near future. Uh, we do anticipate that the formula business ordinance will be uh, heard by the Council in February and the ADU ordinance in March. Over at the Five Cities Fire Authority, uh, I do wanna share that we did have a very nice retirement celebration for Chief Lieberman last Friday uh, to celebrate his nine years with the authority as well as over 30 years in public service. Um, and we are currently recruiting for a fire chief. Uh, so if you know of anybody, send them, send them our way. And then also we do have a special board meeting on January 29th. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we did have a very wonderful employee recognition event earlier today uh, where we did acknowledge the city's employees of the year, as well as those with specific uh, years of service milestones for us. And so I, I thank uh, a couple of you for being there, uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Guthrie and Councilmember Barnich. Um, it was a great event and it was nice uh, being back with the city uh, to see everybody and, and catch up with some folks. and. Uh, it, it was a really good event. So we also thank our party planning people, as we call them, uh, for putting on such a wonderful event and the council's support and having those types of events. It helps us build our employee culture. So uh, thank you very much. And that'll conclude my comments this evening. Any questions or clarifications? Just a quick question on the signal. Um, I was just, I went through it right now. It seems like it's still pretty long. Is that, is that going to change? I'll pass that over to Mr. Bill Robeson. Thank you. Um, so we can adjust the timing. Mm -hmm. uh, we just put the loops back in the ground. The timers are back in, in place or, or set. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll start to look at those a little bit more. I noticed this morning when it came in mm -hmm. that um, maybe they're a little long, so we can adjust the, the seconds um, and um, make it so that it's more efficient. Um, and then just a quick comment, the employee recognition lunch that we had. I just have to say that I think that was the best. I think they just get better every year, but I don't know. I think that was like far head and shoulders above the past. So anyway, I uh, really enjoyed myself. Thanks to the staff that worked so hard to put that together. It was so obvious. <laughs> Food was amazing. So thank you. I'm very sorry to have missed uh, the employee luncheon today. I had a family situation <laughs> I had to deal with, but um, I, I did attend last year. It was wonderful and looking forward to the next time. Thank you. All right. Okay, with that, we will move on to council reports. And since the mayor is not here, I will start. So starting with, uh, let me get my notes here. Central Coast uh, Community Energy has not met yet. We will meet for the first real meeting uh, in February. Um, I did miss the RAC, uh, the Water Resources Advisory Committee meeting in December. I did review the agenda real quickly. Uh, there were no, the only real action item was to allow uh, uh, three new members to who had applied to to start filling out some of the empty seats? I will I'll give an update uh, at, in February if if there's something that comes through in the minutes that I missed there. Uh, Council of Governments or Slow Cog and and, and uh, Slow RTA. Um, so sort of combining the December and January meetings together because most of what we did in December was set up stuff to then vote on in January. I think the the big deal was setting up the. Uh, priority list of, for the for the big projects that we're gonna be seeing going going forward in, in 2024 and, and set up for the future as well. For us, I think the, the key items are the roundabout at Avila with the Avila exit mm -hmm. uh, was a little bit short on funding. So they added some additional funding for that. And so that should be starting, I'm gonna say any day, but you know, any day probably means June, but yeah. <laughs> Um, the U.S. 101 Mobility Lane, which is the extra lane that uh, we were talking about there in Pismo, I've been talking about for a long time, that is fully funded based on the original estimates. Um, and that is set to go forward in 2027. At this point, there were no additional funds needed for that. The Bob Jones Trail was a little bit short on funding, so there was extra funding afforded for that. 
but it is facing a pretty major obstacle due to a property acquisition uh, easement, uh, property easement acquisition problem. And then finally, on 227, the Los Ranchos Road roundabout is, is funded and in design. Um, in the North County, uh, almost all of the money is going out on 41, the, the 41Y project and the Antelope. I think we're up $225 million is being spent there in the next couple, couple three years. Um, the other discussion, major discussion, was the Betterment's grant program, which um, if you're not familiar with that, that, that is a, a setup of small grants designed to help communities either finish off a project. Um, if you'll remember, we actually got a Betterment grant to do some crosswalks, which have now gotten folded into the, um, uh, into the Halcyon Complete Streets program. Um, a couple of places, uh, there's some funding come, carved out right away for Grover Beach and Atascadero for their downtown uh, projects, which are, uh, have, have, uh, have already gone out to bid and came back a little bit high, and therefore they needed uh, an extra, you know, between the two of them, I think it was two and a quarter million, but there's, there's still $8 million left over for what are now competitive grants for each city. A uh, grant can't be more than a million dollars, so these were, it's hard to think of that as a small project, but, uh, but I guess it is. <laughs> um, and certainly we, we will be, I think we already have a, a a, a plan in place that we'll be submitting once once we've approved it here at the council, uh, which should have should have pretty good chance of being funded there. Um, IWMA. Um, so we formally since now all the cities have signed off on the uh, on on the agreement to bring the county back in. We formally uh, canceled our MOU with them that we were providing the services that we're now going to provide them because they're a member. Um, we did have a couple changes of jobs descriptions. We did have a long closed session uh, on a public employment issue. And the county will formally join the board in February, uh, meaning in Jimmy Paulding will be re representing them. I also went to the REACH Development Roundtable. A lot of interesting stuff uh, taken there, a lot of building, building up. There's, there, there's a lot going on at Vandenberg. I'll just tell you that, a whole lot going on at Vandenberg and a whole bunch of support for the, for that will be necessary in that area to support what's going on there. So um, that in particular, but they've, uh, I didn't realize this until this meeting, they've expanded the, the REACH of REACH um, to include South Santa Barbara County. I think this is mostly around, they've now added uh, chips manufacturing as a major uh, part of their, of their push. And uh, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for that in the, in the South Santa Barbara County area. So that concludes my reports. We'll then go on to Council Member Barnage. Uh, let's see, the Zone 3 meeting uh, was canceled, um, not really much to talk about, so we're going to meet in March. Um, you probably saw this in the, your packet, the numbers might be a little different, but the lake is 96.2% full. Um, at least it was when that was, that was written on the Zone 3 agenda. We did have a little bit of a packet. Um, I attended the Homeless Services Oversight Council meeting on January 17th and lots of stuff going on there. Um, there was a public comment that was pretty um, important that there was, there were people, there were multiple people there that um, shared the same thoughts. There was an arrest recently made at a service center for the unhoused in, not here, I, I think in maybe in San Luis Obispo. And the speakers asked, and I've already talked to um, a representative at Roy Rainey Police Department, just that if there was a, an arrest imminent um, to uh, maybe arrest the person after the, after the appointment with the um, shelter or the case manager, just because when the arrest happened, it caused everyone at the shelter to leave. Um, 
And so it had some effect and it was, um, I think it was an evening that was raining or something. So that was just, they wanted us, the public, the public speakers wanted us to pass that on in our cities um, to law enforcement. So that's just a note. Um, there was $360,000 allocated from the county, uh, five different grants and pots of money and um, 360,000 just to Five States Homeless Coalition for rapid rehousing, street outreach and emergency shelter. So that's really good news. Um, they, we've been asking the county for a long time to have a social media presence so we can sort of push out a good news information and they finally do. So if you do have social media, it's on Instagram and Facebook, it's at Slow Co Homeless. Um, and that's gonna be becoming a little bit more robust as they um, sort of develop that. They do have a communication and data department that is new at the county. Um, let's see. So then what's really germane to the to South County, the Five Seas Homeless Coalition, the warming center is currently open uh, when it rains or it drops below 45 degrees. I think it was hosted at the Women's Club and then also at a local church. Uh, recently, the permanent warming center, the permanent during the winter warming center on Grand Avenue is almost due to open. They're still under construction. Perhaps late February is what I'm told. Um, it, the warming center continues to be open up until uh, March 31st. Um, and let's see, average total nights that it's been open this season are six. Average number of guests are only 10. The cabins for change occupancy right now is 21 people. Total since opening, 34 people have been housed in permanent housing that were housed at the cabins for change. So that's some good news. Just the December uh, stats for Five Cities Homeless Coalition, 473 walk-ins to the office, which is pretty incredible. Um, 97 coordinated entry survey, surveys taken. They prevented evictions of 20, 21 households and their uh, Five Cities Homeless Coalition is case managing 42 youth that are homeless. Um, and let's see, make sure that's, um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's always so good to hear the good news um, regarding the housing situation and 42 youth is an awful lot. Uh, it's sad to know there's the need, but it's just so awesome to know it's being met. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, I, I don't know if this is appropriate, but I'm just gonna ask and you can tell me. The issue with someone being arrested, was that a warrant or was someone like disturbing the peace? Cause I could understand why that couldn't wait. Yeah. Don't what, ask. <laughs> what the limited information I have is that I think that that was uh, perhaps a warrant. It was it was and yeah. they knew the person was going to be there, which is which I, is fine. I, there's extenuating circumstances. I think it was just it caused this huge ruckus and they were trying to help other people, but the people were all scared. So of course, like, yeah. Yeah, of course, that yeah. totally makes sense. Thank yeah. you. Um, just in terms of my reports, which are brief as as they usually are, um, air pollution control district meets actually tomorrow morning. So I'll have to give an update next time. Um, South County Chamber of, of Commerce always has a lot going on. The main things I would say at this point, they have a actually tomorrow, a January mixer, which is a mocktail mixer, which seems great for January, uh, at the Clark Center from five to seven. Um, and they're also doing the Rise and Shine, uh, slow, uh, South County, sorry, on February 7th. And that's obviously in the morning, 7.30 to nine. So that's all I have to report at this point. <laughs> Thank you. And with that, we will move on. Mike. With that, we'll move on to community comments and suggestions. Uh, this is public commentary for items that are not on the agenda. Um, I'll, you know, I, I guess I'll read the whole thing. Uh, public commentary invitation to members of the community to present issues, thoughts, and suggestions on matters not scheduled on this agenda. Comments should be limited to those matters that are within the jurisdiction of the city council. Members of the public may provide public comment in person. 
or remotely by joining the Zoom meeting using one of the methods provided below. Please, please raise your hand when you indicate your desire to speak. So I'll start here with our, one of our, any of our two people in the audience who have any comments for public comment. I would like to jump in. Our mic has been well loved at the podium and it is now broken. However, it is picking up audio. So if any of you provide comment later, you're going to have to hold it, unfortunately, but it is working. So. All right, thank you for that. Any takers? All right, and with that, we'll check in online. Okay, we do have one member of the public on Zoom with their hand raised. So let me allow them to talk. All right, Candice, um, you are now able to provide comment. Yes. Anyone else online? Jessica, any, anyone else? I'm sorry. Um, there are no other members of the public online. All right. And with that, I'll close public, public comment on that and bring it back to staff for any response to the one question we had there. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I'm Bill Robeson, Public Works Director. Um, so uh, Candace is right. She, she, and, uh, and our staff have been collaborating for a few years. Uh, I think the issue that we're running into is the measures that we're allowed to put in place uh, through engineering design and code are uh, not able to be put in place um, like the neighbor or at least a few of the neighbors would like. So um, there's been a lot of data collected. I can go through that. Um, <clears throat> Candace sent us um, a, an email, so uh, I was uh, copied on that, or actually it was probably sent to me. It was sent to John Benedetti and Robin Dickerson. As you know, Robin Dickerson is uh, our former city engineer. 
We have a new, new city engineer. Um, I'll go through a few of the data points, but I, I would like to uh, offer that we can meet again. I think the thing that, that I'm uh, faced with is, again, the, the measures that the neighborhood, or at least some of the neighbors would like to put in place are just not able to be put in place through our engineering standards. So uh, the um, speed bumps, uh, there is a standard that requires a distance from uh, driveways. And there's many driveways. A lot of them are close together. These uh, properties are close together. So uh, it doesn't allow us to do something um, that's meeting those engineering standards. And when we start to go outside of those standards, we become liable for issues uh, like uh, damage to cars or uh, slowing of response times potentially. Although I think uh, the fire department is probably able to move through there uh, generally pretty quickly, but um, there's a lot of issues that come in, uh, into play there. But um, our police have been out several times. We've done speed surveys. Uh, there's no real, there's no indication of speeding in, in the area from the data that we've collected. And um, I think that there were um, six traffic surveys that, that have been done over a, a couple of years. Uh, we put in additional 25 MPH uh, markings on the street, which uh, city staff has done. And that's not really a standard either because you're going through a residential um, street, which is always 25 miles per hour. We wanted to reinforce that to people. Um, there were uh, surveys shown of the vehicles per day, and the vehicles per day since 21, 2021 have dropped from 625 uh, down to 555 vehicles uh, from a survey shown in 2023. Um, we also got a lot of feedback from people about a multifamily um, project that was existing in the neighborhood. It had, had significant remodel um, and a lot of uh, the points that people were bringing up were alleviated uh, because of that project, but uh, maybe things have changed. So um, we've tried several things. Uh, we're, we're still committed to trying uh, to work with the neighborhood. So uh, Candace is probably listening and, and we'll try to schedule something with her uh, over the next few weeks and, um, and try something uh, maybe unconventional, but we'll, we'll just have to, to see how that proceeds. So thank you. I can answer any more questions if you have any. I have Kara. Okay. Um, so I just was, if you have the information bill, and if not, you can get it to the uh, the council, full council later. But I was just curious. I know that there's been work. I know that staff has worked with them in the past. And mm -hmm. um, but the so we have done speed surveys. That's correct. Okay. How many have we done? Uh, six. Six are shown from the PD that or police department that um, they've shared with us. Okay, and those are those are probably done the last couple of years, different times, That's you know, correct. different days a week, summer, right. winter, right? Okay. Police department has also gone out and uh, monitored, patrolled, um, and uh, they gave a ticket, um, and it was to a resident. Um, so uh, it, it's it's been a challenge. So. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll continue on, but I can answer any more questions. Well, I so I guess I would just ask, according to the speed surveys, there's not at this time anything warranted to be done because of what the data, the data we've collected. That's correct. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bill. Sure. Thank you. Um, so first of all, of course, we appreciate all, all the work you've done. And I know this is something sounds like you guys have been working on this a long time. Um, I guess I'm still just curious. I don't doubt the sincerity of, of the folks calling in, and mm -hmm. they, they've also done a, a pretty amazing amount of work on their own. And I'm just wondering, do you have, I mean, and maybe you can't say this, but do you have an idea of what is, I'm just wondering, I guess, what, what is causing their concern? And do, could it possibly be just the volume of, of traffic that goes through that neighborhood because of the number of dwellings? No. Um, you know, I, I'll, we'll, renew our conversations with them and Thank we you. will um, we'll update the, the council. Uh, but I think the, the main uh, point that I would like to make tonight is we've done a lot of work, we've cooperated, we've coordinated with the neighborhood. They've done a lot of work, uh, like you said, council member Seacrest, and we'll continue on uh, trying to find a solution. Thank you, thanks very much. 
again, I'll, I'll just request that you, if, if you could send this, maybe copy us all on the speed survey, just sure. to see, see what, what, what the data says there. Okay, with that, Oh, con the consent agenda. So the consent agenda are items that we generally uh, adopt all together. And I will check with Mike. Any, anybody want to pull anything for special comment or? OK. Um, well, then I'll in entertain a motion. If you want to open it up to the public. Oh, you're right. <laughs> so yes, I will open it up to the public for uh, comment on the consent agenda items. Seeing no one here, anyone online? If any members of the public on Zoom would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. There are no members of the public anymore, so no comment. All right. Okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion. Okay, Mr. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, I would move approval of the consent ag agenda, which is items 9A through 9F. Good second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So if I could just add a comment, I do, do want to congratulate staff on a, another mm. perfect uh, audit. Uh, I think that's m many years in a row now, but it is good to see that, that going forward. So with that, if we can have a roll call, please. Councilmember Farnage? Yes. Councilmember Seacrest? Yes. Mayor Guthrie. Mayor Pro Tem Guthrie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's me. That's right. <laughs> All right, so we will then move on to, there's no public hearings, there's no old business, and we'll move on to new business, which is consideration of the 2024 pavement priority project list and finding the project is not subject to environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act. Thank you. So is this one of the two of you? Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Council. My name is Shannon Sweeney, city engineer. And I'm here to speak about the 2024 pavement maintenance program. And I bring to you uh, for consideration a restrategization, restrat that's a hard word to say, of the 2022 pavement maintenance plan that you've approved previously. And I'll explain why, uh, given that we have um, some extra funding to put into this project, why restrategizing makes sense at this time. And also to identify a priority list for pavement improvement projects to be considered for the upcoming 2024 pavement management project. I suspect that many people know that the rating of the pavement is done through the pavement condition index, but I'm happy to share it again. A uh, pavement is rated from a scale of zero to 100, where 100 is brand new pavement and zero is there is no more asphalt left. And then you can see this scale of good, fair, and poor. Our goal is a PCI average through our community of 80. I'd be happy if we were in the 70s, but we're not. Neither is California. Uh, California does this uh, survey. The latest that was to gather throughout the state of California was in 2020, and the average weighted pavement condition index was 66. Ours is a paltry 57. So a little bit of background, we've been doing our pavement uh, maintenance programs for quite some time. In 2010, we had a PCI of 71, did it again in 2016 and it dropped to 68, and again in 2022 and it dropped uh, to 56. Uh, we have about 73 centerline miles of pavement throughout the community. And uh, the 2022 pavement maintenance plan indicated that we had a 74 million dollar backlog of pavement work and that's reflective of that PCI 56. That means that there's a lot that needs considerable work and for us to catch up and be in that 80 range we would need 74 million dollars. There is a preferred pavement maintenance approach and this diagram demonstrates that. So um, this shows a curve of pavement that if you ignored it, that's that green line, it would fall from a PCI of 100 down to zero in about 20 years. But if you caught it uh, before it falls to a PCI of 80 and you did say a slurry seal, then it'd bring it up and then it'd fall a little bit and you do another slurry 
uh, do that about every six to eight years. And you can actually extend this all the way to almost 30 years uh, before you need to do something maybe a little bit more robust, such as a slurry seal with some dig outs or a cape seal or some kind of treatment, not a rehabilitation or an overlay, but you're still in the slurry um, range. And doing slurries is about $3 per square yard. And then after 30 years, you have to apply 16 to $42 per square yard for um, that more robust maintenance. But you got pavement that's lasting about 30 years, and it never drops past that good condition. So it all stays uh, relatively nice. Unfortunately, this is our maintenance scenario. So you can see that same green line running from 100 down to zero in 20 years uh, when you wait until you know, you're in the PCI of the, the 20s to 40s, now it's going to cost you $117 per square yard to do an overlay, and it brings you back up to 100 and then you get another, you know, few years out of it as it, it falls back down. And because we have a PCI of 56, we've got a lot of streets that this is the world that we're living in. And, uh, residents that are on these streets, you know, they notice the significant deterioration, whereas if we had been doing slurries, then it's in a lot better condition. So we have um, some data from the last two kind of construction projects that we've done that really helps illustrate this with real dollar amounts. So we had a 2022 slurry seal and dig out project and we put $1.7 million of construction funds for 8.3 miles. So if you do that math, it ends up being $205,000 per mile. If you take our 73 miles of, of uh, streets and you slurry every six years, you would need to put in a minimum of $2.5 million per year. Now, this is assuming that all your streets are good, ours are not. Um, and this doesn't include uh, design and testing, so it's really $3 million. If you don't put at least $3 million a year, you're not going to be able to keep your pavement in good shape. Now, we also did an overlay project for 3.6 miles, and that cost $3.8 million. Do the math on that, and you're at $1.1 million per mile. That's five times the amount of money if you waited until it was an overlay. Now, the recent investment prior to 2023 was $1.25 million a year. Our 2022 pavement maintenance program shows work assuming $1.25 million a year because that was really all that we could count on when that report was written. We've had um, the fortunate event of being able to put approximately $5.5 million per year in last year's and this upcoming one in order to do work. That's why it makes sense to re-strategize what we're going to do for this upcoming project. This just illustrates what uh, a year's worth of $1.25 million per year is. The, there's a, a program called Street Saver. All of our streets are in it. They take a look at the condition of the road from a real 10,000 foot view and says, based on an algorithm, here's the work that you should do. You got some, you know, overlays and some crack seals and some, you know, slurries, but it's scattered all over the town and it, it's really all over the place. This is how we are going to be able to have a project minimum of five point, say, eight million dollars for this upcoming project. And this is the funding where it's coming from. Uh, 2.4 million from the general fund. You've got some SB1 money, which is some state tax money at 450,000. Sales tax fund of uh, 2 million would carry over of about half a million. You've got um, community development block grant money of mm, about $60,000 a year. And the sidewalk sales tax fund. And you add all of that up and you end up with 5.8 million. So at this point in time, we need to decide what to do with this 5.8 million. It doesn't make sense really to follow what the pavement maintenance program because that assumed you only had 1.25. This allows us to look at a grander scale of what's going on. I've spent hours staring at this map. This is from the pavement maintenance plan and what it does is it color codes all of our streets based on their condition, based on their PCI. 
what you'll notice is that there are some groupings, some neighborhoods where all the streets fall in that poor range. So I talked to our pavement consultant, who by the way is here and can help answer questions, um, Joe Ryrie. And so look at this and go, is there a way for us to apply this $5.8 million in a really meaningful way? Uh, all of these would suggest that they would need, based on their PCI, suggest that they would need heavy rehabilitation. But through some strategic deflection testing, we should go out and, and measure how much the road bends when weight is put on it. It might suggest that another treatment might be plausible, such as overlay. So they went out and they did deflection testing on those areas that have circles because they suggested that those were neighborhood style projects. You'll see X is crossed out on the private developments and also there's an X on the equestrian area and that's because that was done in this last project. All right, some considerations on why this approach might make sense. One of them is when you do that real all over the city project, you end up with lots of traffic control plans and lots of encroachment permits are all over the place. Whereas if you do a neighborhood style, that you're really focusing your work on neighborhood areas. Uh, when you have one prime and numerous subcontractors with, with markup, because you have several different treatment types, the project gets more expensive. Whereas if you can focus on one treatment type, in this case overlays, the project ends up being um, more cost effective. The larger you have one single treatment type, the lower the unit cost. So you really get an economy of scale by being able to put a large amount of money into one single project. And also, um, potential contractors like these bigger projects, and therefore we're likely to get a more competitive price on it because more contractors will be interested in it. So. Our consultant came back with a list and my jaw dropped because I was shocked at the results. So I'll walk through what's here. So what you see is you see the location where those circles were in that previous, and I've given them names just to help uh, distinguish them. So you have the stagecoach area, the Rancho Grande Phase 1, the Brighton area, Station Way, which is just a single street, uh, Andre Drive and its environment, uh, Woodland and its um, neighborhood and then via La Barranca. And in the pavement maintenance program, it estimated what the cost would be based on its PCI. When you look at the cost based on the testing, which really starts to hone in on the proper treatment needed for it, what you'll notice is that those top three on there are significantly lower than the pavement maintenance program identified because we're getting at it on a the, um, strategy of getting to it before it falls to the next treatment needed. Um, I've also included the amount of work that needs to be done on uh, ramps. Whenever you do a uh, rehabilitation, you need to do the curb ramps as well. So I've had to fold those costs into here as well. So then you add the cost of the curb ramps plus the cost based on testing, you get a total estimated cost. And then the final column is the savings from the pavement maintenance program. I have listed these in order of their savings. I, I've also included cum, uh, cumulative cost. And if you see if you do the top three projects, you end up at 5.6 million. We have $5.8 million available. And if we do these three projects at this time, we save ourselves about five million dollars in work that we would that would end up costing us if we deferred this work. So I believe that this is a compelling argument to move forward on these type three on these top three projects. Um, these other projects are are worth considering, but that's only if additional funds come about. But with the funding we have available, um, these these top three really stand out as as good projects to do. So my recommendation is that we strategize that we not do the work that was recommended in the PMP uh, because we have an opportunity to do projects that you notice there's no way we could have done them prior because all the total cost estimated all were above the 1.25 million. And in fact, in the pavement maintenance plan, none of these three neighborhoods 
ever showed up being done in the next 10 years. So the, the thing that would have continued deteriorating. So this is an opportunity to really use this funding in a cost-effective manner to address um, some, some pavement that, that could really use some love. Uh, so that's why re-strategizing makes sense. There will, may be some residents on those streets that are shown in the pavement maintenance program that will say, hey, this plan that you approved said you were going to take care of my street in this year. So I wanted to make sure that council was comfortable with deviating from that in order to take advantage of these projects. And then to use the priority table that was presented to determine what our project scope would be, along with some other minor work that's associated with pavement maintenance, such as striping, concrete work, and pedestrian improvements based on funding that may become available in the near future, such as uh, the potential of that betterments grant uh, that may uh, come to be, but we don't know at this time whether or not we'll be successful at it. Uh, I'm open to any questions, and uh, Joe Ryrie has graciously um, offered to be able to answer any questions you might have as well. Thank you. We'll start with you, <coughs> Council Mercy Chris. Thank you. Um, you know, this, uh, I'm always amazed because this obviously takes a lot of work and, and um, I didn't start understanding anything about pavement and how expensive it was until I was running for this office. And if you, if you sit through one of these presentations, you start to realize uh, how important this is and as you say, the economies of scale and also really how important time is um, and you just can't let this go. So I would be certainly in favor of your proposal. I am i didn't quite understand, are there people, there's people that were thinking they were gonna get um, help with their neighborhoods and they're not going to be getting that now and then would, would they be re would they be next on the list or how does that work? I didn't quite right. understand, sorry. Uh, thank you for that question. <laughs> I. I could imagine that if I grabbed that report and I lived on one of the streets that were shown, I'll just bring that up real quick, um, that was shown on this, right. and I would say, okay, it's 2024. I yeah, live on that okay. street that's colored blue. Why isn't this being done? Yeah. Um, now, the heavy maintenance is a uh, slurry with digouts. So one of the things that I've done is looked ahead to see whether or not a slurry project for next year makes sense. And I asked our consultant whether deferring those by a year would make a big difference. And the answer was no. So what I'm envisioning is that this year is this overlay project attacking those three neighborhoods. And next year would be a culmination of these slurry sales from multiple years, again, to make a single one type of maintenance project to really, again, buy into that economies of scale. Thank you, that definitely makes sense. I have no questions. Yeah, I, I, I do have a couple questions. Um, so when we did the uh, uh, equestrian area, what, what sort of PCI do we have there now after that? after we did that project that okay so um this sorry. Uh, this shows that the pci basically comes back to um new pavement so you can call that and i we now say it's 100 even it's, it's now, probably going to wear out faster yeah. yes it's now back to 100 and and so for this kind of an area doing the slurry code every eight years isn't going to make much difference it's it's beyond that. Yeah, a, a slurry coat doesn't. No, even after we've done the work we did, we, we brought it back to 100. So, sorry, is this yes. area, so, so, so six so, years from now, we would then do a slurry on and, here. And we and might then get. It falls back into, in, that. into that pattern. Okay. So, so, I guess one thing that strikes me when we did, you know, I mean, that's not a quarter of the city or anything, but we've taken it from probably in the 50s all the way up to 100, but we only gained one point overall in PCI. Because we went from 56 to 57. Okay. Citywide. Okay. Citywide, so, yeah, citywide, yes. So um, I actually asked for a proposal to recalculate our PCI following these projects. Uh, so I have that proposal in hand. It's a few thousand dollars. 
um, but I didn't want to be presumptuous at what council would um, approve before dropping those okay. new numbers into it to do that calculation. Once we know what the project looks like, then it would, then we'll calculate that new PCI and bring that to, to council's attention. So for instance, we, we could end up with a projection of the PCI after the project's done. Correct. Okay. Um, and then how do we select the streets that we decided to test? And, and how many more streets should we test? Okay, so the, it's from that map that I yeah. stared at for hours. The circles, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the way that I did it was um, things that are green, those are very good. Those are in that slurry seal range. Those are still in the range that a slurry seal is the appropriate. Um, and same with blue. You know, blue, you can get away with a slurry seal and dig out. Once you fall into that yellow, which we have so very little yellow on here, once you fall into that orange, the question is, can you stay in orange and not fall into red? Because yeah. a red is a full depth reclamation and it costs at least double. In fact, the best way to approach that is with this list, these numbers cost on the PMP assumed full depth reclamation for those top three projects. And that's what it would have cost double what the overlay is that is the recommendation for three, these three neighborhoods. So what we're doing is we're catching these three neighborhoods before they fall into that next step. Yes, yeah, so, so I guess we selected these orange areas. There's lots of other orange areas as well. So right. what was, and, and are those areas somewhere we just don't think is worth testing or we just no. haven't gotten around to testing it or? I just focused on neighborhoods, um, mostly because when you're doing deflection testing, um, you can make the assumption that if it's a neighborhood, it was all done at once. Done at once. Mm -hmm. So it allows us to be very um, cost effective in our deflection testing. Um, because we can then say, well, that entire neighborhood, since it was all built at once, all of it can can follow the same treatment. Okay. But you're right. We do have a lot of additional streets that could benefit from this, but we are already out of money. We can't even do um, all of them that we did our deflection testing on. Okay. No, I, I, I understand that. I, was, I just thought there was maybe some some part of the the pavement index study that we did that told us where we might have better opportunities. Okay. No, we just looked at, at large groupings of um, poor pavement. Okay. And so then um, this project you're talking about tonight would be um, in the 25, 26 year. Okay. I, when we start talking about next year, I just, I just want to, cause this year we're going to finish the slurry coat. This, this, so, right. so would this be done in the fall of twenty five? That is no. I mean the fall so of twenty four. We are in we are in twenty three twenty four now. Right. We hope to build this in twenty four twenty five. Okay, and so when you said next year for the, That's the that would actually be twenty six twenty five twenty six twenty five twenty six. Okay. Okay. Um, those were my questions. All right, thank you. All right, and with that, I'll open it to the public. Uh, any questions or comments from the public? I do have one question. So it looks like deflection testing has saved or has the potential to save a lot of money. My question is, over the years, should we expect more deflection testing? Just or is this deflection testing more of an opportunistic uh, uh, thing? Yeah. So let's, I'm sorry, let's go online then and see if there's any questions online. Thanks. There are no members of the public online. All right, thank you. So yeah, if uh, staff can respond to the, to the one question we had, that'd be great, thanks. I'd be happy to. Um, so, one of the interesting things about pavement is you can't necessarily just look at it and know what kind of treatment is appropriate for it. Because if you look at the streets in these neighborhoods, like, you know, there's, there's no saving this. It looks like it needs full on uh, dig out, you know, 
to replace the whole thing. So what the deflection testing does is it tests how much the pavement moves and if there's enough there structure wise then putting two inches of an overlay or in some places three inches um, is sufficient to be able to revert back to that PCI of 100. If there's too much deflection testing, it's indicating that there's just not enough structure there and you need to pull it out and rebuild it from the, the ground up. So uh, I am happy to have done the deflection testing to provide a pre-design of sorts to enable us to really look at the funding that's available and align it best with the treatment. Um, and it is something that I would recommend that we do on a yearly basis when having projects that are the, uh, is it an overlay, is it a reclamation? That kind of testing is not necessary when it's simply a maintenance project because the pavement is still has enough structure to it that the deflection testing isn't warranted. I do, I, sorry, I do have a couple of other items that have been brought to my attention that might be good for a council and the public to know. And one of them was, well, why do we have a higher budget this year um, than we did in the past? Um, some of it is carryover. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we really um, kind of battened everything down and didn't spend as much because we weren't sure about what revenues would come in and we now have the opportunity, that's what this last year's project was, was the opportunity to then, you know, expand our project. Um, there is some revenue surplus that is being applied this time that doesn't exist in um, most years. Uh, after this project, uh, we've taken a look at uh, the funding that's available and it uh, will revert back to um, the, the 1.25 to 1.75. Uh, million dollars per year. So these are um, unique years. They aren't that we can't anticipate this kind of funding given our current circumstances. With that, I think we'll move on. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> That we'd move on to council comments. Okay, sorry. I <laughs> thought you were moving on further than that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you were looking for a German word. <laughs> so, still sore about the whole please, Mayor Pro Tem thing. But. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, yes, yeah. thank you. So, I am delighted to hear this information, and it, I think that it's it's a great. Uh, advertisement for the deflection testing, the fact that when you went back and, and did the testing, some things are looking better than maybe we thought, and layperson here, but it sounds like we're actually, the estimates come in much lower, so that's great. I appreciate the comment about the um, the extra reserves, because I think that we were, we voted on that, and that was a big deal, that, that, that re those reserves were there, and that we could put it towards uh, this very expensive project, which never goes away. Um, and I appreciate your comment about the la last year and this year being unique and getting in the funding up to $5 because that is, that's not normal, and we don't have that normally, and the public needs, needs to understand that. Um, so I appreciate all that everyone's done, and I would certainly be in favor of re-strategizing and um, following, you know, what, what you all feel is appropriate. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Excellent staff report, Ms. Sweeney. I am sorry we didn't get to hear from Joe. We always like to hear from Joe, but I'm happy to see his face in the audience, so that's good. Um, and yes, makes a lot of sense. Happy that staff has dug into it and um, came up with this genius solution to save the city and the taxpayers money and makes a lot of sense and I'm ready to move forward. Thank you. So I'm, I'm too ready to move forward. I, I, do, I do think we should note here that this is about 100% return on investment. Uh, you know, we, for $5 million, we're going to save $5 million. It's, it's hard to beat that, um, even in a rising stock market. But uh, I, I do have one concern, and that is, you know, when we look at, at, at the eight-year slurry coat plan, we're way behind eight years. And I, I understand that 
we can look at a road and say, hey, it doesn't really need it. This is still a better investment, and I'm not doubting that. I am concerned that we're, you know, either either the engineering report that says we have to do it eight years is is wrong, and actually it's every 12 years because that's at best where we're at. But I, I am concerned that if we don't, you know, if we're going to do some sort of coding this year on the, on the good stuff, and I don't know how much how much of it's left to be sorry because there's there's not that much good stuff <laughs> um, that once we finish this year, I, I don't know whether we're half done with having the whole thing sort of coded, you know, in, in, in eight years or not, or even close to that. But that, that is a concern I have. Uh, I, I understand two different projects going on at the same time. I did have, have, have one final question I want to ask, and we're going to have the traffic way bridge going at the same time that we have, I think, this project going. And do you see that as a conflict at all? I, I think they're pretty far apart, but I, I did want to ask about that. Certainly, good question, and I can appreciate the concern. So right now, we are working diligently on the traffic way bridge replacement project um, with the right-of-way portion of it. Our goal is to go, it's to have the design completed in um, late summer, go out to bid in the fall and winter, and construction is currently scheduled for April through December of 2025. Um, I really was anxious to have this conversation today because that would enable us to be able to design this project, get it out to bid in the summer, have it constructed the winter of 25 so that it would be 24 to 25 so that it would be completed in advance of the traffic weight bridge replacement. Okay. Um, and so with that, I'll, so, so in the form of a motion, do we just want to approve the the pavement management program for the, I'll call it the next pavement management program. And are we also approving the, the list of priority or, or do you only need the, the approval of this particular project? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, we'd recommend uh, just forming the recommendation based on the three components of staff's recommendation. So that is the priority list, um, okay. the authorization to the city manager for additional projects should funds become available, and the CEQA exemption. Uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I would move uh, that we approve a priority list in the staff report of the streets for the 2024 pavement management program. We authorize the city manager to choose the remaining projects on the list to maximize the project size and cost efficiency if more fun funds became, become available along with the minor work associated with pavement maintenance. And find this project is categorically exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act under the Class Two exemption, which applies to the replacement or reconstruction of existing structures. The second. Okay, we have a motion and second. If we could have a roll call, please. Councilmember Varnish. Yes. Councilmember Seacrest. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Guthrie. Yes. I'm supposed to leave mine on, probably, huh? So uh, with that, we'll move on to council communications. Let me start with Council Member Varnage. So let's see, just two things. I wanted to know, are we done with the noisy work in the village? I think we are. The simple answer is yes. Yay. <clears throat> awesome. Excellent. Okay. And then the other uh, comment I wanted to make that I think is new, that is great, it are the staff reports have the little links in them to where other things are attached, um, not right in the staff report. I think that's handy to have that in there. So I appreciate that. Those are all my comments. Uh, no comment except for just seconding uh, Councilperson Barnage's view, having the staff reports embedded in the items is very, very helpful, and thank you for that. And I have no comments, and so with that, we're adjourned. So no way, I didn't break the record. I didn't break the record. <laughs> it's safe. We had no proclamation. <laughs> and we didn't spend a million dollars. <laughs> Just say. <laughs> oh, Jessica. Mike said there's some delay. He told me before the meeting. Okay. Yeah.
There we go. That's it.